Hi, it's Rob Little here with details of something even more exciting than watching 11 Supreme Court judges copulate in a hot tub. Uh, You won't want to miss this. I will soon be joining Brendan for a special live edition of the Brendan O'Neill Show. Miss that and your friends will shun you and you will be forever denied the love of Jesus Christ. It's part of Podcast Live in London on Saturday. Book your tickets now at something called podcastlive.com. Meanwhile, back to Brendan. It's upsetting because we have seen a different sort of Jeremy Corbyn on this, and it wasn't necessary. The people who were zealot remainers don't think he's gone far enough. So they have now, they've got the Lib Dems to switch to. He had a real opportunity to, you know, not go along with everything the government said, but to be absolutely clear, as he originally was, that we were going to leave. We wanted to get a good deal, but we had to get out. So, yes, I think he will regret this. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Kate Hoey. Kate is a Labour MP, but she is also much more than that. Not that there is anything wrong with being a Labour MP, She's been the MP for Vauxhall in London since 1989. She was a Minister for Sport in Tony Blair's government between 1999 and 2001. She is one of the most colourful, outspoken figures in Parliament. She's known for her maverick approach to political life, rarely taking comfortable party lines. So she is very much pro-Brexit and was a tireless campaigner for leave during the referendum in 2016. She is also against the ban on fox hunting, liberal on the issue of gun ownership and a believer in the common sense of the public. All things that put her somewhat at odds with the mainstream left today, especially the woke left. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. My first question is actually a very straightforward one, which is that it's coming up to three and a half years since we voted to leave. Um, and we know we're no closer to leaving. And in fact, in some ways, it seems like we're further away than ever before. So are we ever going to leave the EU? Is it possible for a country to leave the European Union? The European Union has made it as difficult as possible. And all those various treaties that we so happily signed up to without ever asking the British people <laughs> helped to make it as difficult as possible. But we have a, a referendum where we were told your vote will be respected. Parliament abrogated the responsibility to those people, the public, to say, do you want to leave? They voted to leave. I I just think it will be a genuinely catastrophic blow to democracy in this country if we don't leave Mm. because we have a parliament that actually doesn't want to leave. But I still have confidence that we will leave I'm not having so much confidence in how or when. Mm. Um, And certainly those of us who voted to leave will not give up until we have left the European Union and got back that kind of independence that our country needs. That disparity that that you mentioned, and which I think occupies a lot of people's minds, which is between the public that wants one thing, 52% of voters, and parliamentarians who seem to want something quite different, or certainly a majority of parliamentarians, including an even larger majority in your own Mm. party. Uh, What do you think explains that divergence in public opinion? How have we had a situation where the public has maintained a pretty healthy scepticism in relation to the EU, whereas a significant chunk of the political class has uh, seems to have this kind of sometimes quite slavish devotion to the idea that the European Union is the only way to do politics. I can sometimes hardly understand some of my colleagues who have come from a a left tradition, Mm. who have uh, in the past uh, said things that were clearly not going to be able to be carried through while we were still in the EU. And yet somehow now I have got themselves into a situation where having voted to remain and lost that argument, they aren't prepared to to give up, you know, and it's very interesting how many of them now are talking about how uh, the the present government is trying to sort of 
get round conventions and do things differently yeah. and, and t- you know, talk about proroguing parliament and all of that kind of thing. When actually over the years, so many of them allowed powers to be taken away without any discussion, even in parliament sometimes of things that were happening. And I, th- I, 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 um, understand that many of my colleagues did vote to remain, but I think what the crucial thing was the establishment generally, and I'm using that in a very wide ranging way, genuinely thought they were going to win. Mm. We, there wouldn't have been a referendum by David Cameron if he had thought there was any chance of losing. And it was so clear right through the campaign, they were taking it for granted. They were taking people for granted. And they didn't talk to people in the way that some of us on the Leave campaign did because we understood up in northern areas in the Midlands just how neglected people felt. And that is what's so astonishing. I think they felt that they had been ignored by the people. And it's almost like as if they want to get their own back. Well, we're yeah. not going to allow them to have their way because they were wrong. Uh, the, uh, on the question of the establishment, the, the kind of broad use of that term, the establishment, one thing that strikes me is that, firstly, there is the problem that they're not particularly in touch with what lots of people around the country are thinking. And that became very clear with the referendum result. I also think this is a group of people, um, this is a generalisation, who who are used to getting their way in politics. And I think one of the problems they have had since 2016 is this idea that another group of people might get their way instead. And so the pushback has become incredibly, over time, in fact, and increasingly uh, angry from the establishment. There's an angry pushback. There's an increasingly hysterical pushback, this idea that the people are plunging the nation into mayhem and we have to save it. Mm. Do, Do you think there's an element where... There's a sense of entitlement, a sense of distance from the public and a sense of entitlement among the establishment, which means that they simply, they feel they cannot allow this result to go through. I think there is a a fear amongst many of those people that if they allow this to happen, you know, what could happen next? Because, they, you know, what, what seems to be very clear now is that not just on the EU, but a number of other issues, what the public, the vast majority of decent, ordinary men and women in this country are saying and thinking is very different from the view that is now being put forward both in Parliament, but throughout the media, throughout our newspapers, throughout that kind of layer of of uh, information and communication that the average person living out, uh, out, out in the countryside and out in the country generally doesn't have really much influence over. And they hear it all the time on their media and they hear the uh, the journalists saying things that they are, have no way of being able to answer back. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think we're in, you know, very dangerous times in terms of just how angry people are. And ironically, the, the, the people who are most angry are not the people who normally would be coming out on the streets and demonstrating, whereas those who are on the Remain side mm. and are out and demonstrating, they've been used to coming out and demonstrating. You look at any of the pictures of the people out over the last week or so, and they are people who I'm sure have been on demonstrations before. And that, again, is building a, a huge gap yeah. between those who think they should be running things and those who are feeling completely left out and ignored. I think that what I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the left and the left's mm. changing attitude to the European Union over time. But one of the things just to kick it off is about those protests, you know, the stop the coup protests and all these people, as you say, they are Remainers taking to the streets to argue against the proroguing of parliament and what they now see as an attack on parliamentary sovereignty. I mean, it's, it's so layered with hypocrisy and a lack of self-awareness that even I find myself quite surprised that these things are happening because, of course, a lot of these people would be more than happy and, in fact, have argued for the um, overturning of the largest democratic vote in UK history, the vote for Brexit. And as you said earlier, pro-EU people have sold off huge elements of parliamentary sovereignty over the past 30 or 40 years through the various treaties and bills that they have voted for. So it's now reached a point almost where Remainers are attacking democracy, but they're using the language of democracy itself, which I think is quite a difficult Mm. and dangerous situation for politics to get into. If it wasn't so serious, what what the position we're in, it would be almost laughable (laughs) what's going on. I mean, the hysterical 
scenes we saw and the language of coups and uh, people being told that they are absolutely destroying our country because of what a prime minister did in terms of adding a few extra days to a a recess is really mind-blowing. And Mm. it's, again, a way that the the Remain campaign now have got of trying to, you know, they've lost some of the arguments, but now they're turning to the argument that actually has been the strongest point of the Leave campaign and has brought many Remain voters to accept the result of the referendum, and that is democracy. But they're now using the word in a completely opposite way. Yeah. And, you know, it drives me mad when I see it and I hear the way the journalists have been reporting it in the media and the BBC and Sky and so on. But at the same time, I always have this great feeling that the public are not taken in, the public are not stupid. I think there are politicians who genuinely think that somehow out there, the public, you know, are listening to their every word and listening and believing everything that, uh, you know, Adam Bolton or some of the journalists on BBC say. They're not. It angers me and it upsets me, but I still have that confidence in the basic Mm. decency and sensibleness of the common sense of of the British people. I've been on both of the two recent Stop the Coup demonstrations. And one of the things that I find depressing about these protests and, and events over the past three years in general is the way in which the left has increasingly thrown its weight behind the European Union. And that's been gathering pace over time, but it's become incredibly clear. And you've made the point on numerous occasions that the Labour Party, and particularly the left of the Labour Party, in fact, has always had, has traditionally had a sceptical view of European institutions and European integration, right from Clement Attlee through to Michael Mm. Foote. Of course, Tony Benn was one of the most articulate defenders of British democracy against European integration. So could you just describe to us why you think that was an important part of Labour politics for such a long time and why you think it's kind of fallen apart in more recent years? Well, when I joined the Labour Party, we were a party of being opposed to, um, you know, the common market. And Mm. of course, I grew up with the sort of uh, wonderful speeches of people like Barbara Castle. And the 1983 election was fought on a manifesto of wanting to leave the common market or the European uh, community. I think that all changed, of course, because of the Thatcher government and the the attacks that there were on workers' rights and the whole attitude towards trade unions. And I think the trade union movement, the European Union commissioners were very clever because they saw that that was a way of actually getting the trade unions to look differently, talking about social chapter and that the only way you can have your rights defended would be to be part of the, the European Union. And so, of course, Neil Kinnock first started to shift on, on on the issue. And then um, Tony Blair, when he came in, I remember him telling all of us who were in, in administers, you know, we want to be good Europeans. We want to be, play our role. I actually was in the Home Office before I was sports minister and I would mm. go out to the EU with Jack Straw, who was the Home Secretary, because at that time, Justice and Home Affairs were still w- where we could stop something. You know, it wasn't majority voting. And it, I mean, if if I hadn't been sceptic then, which I was, I certainly would have been having had some time in, in Brussels and just seeing how it works. It's mm. just such a dreadful, dreadful place. And what I couldn't stand was the whole idea that there was always, you know, we'll give you this if you give us that. And this kind of maneuvering and, and, and playing sort of politics within the different countries when the people who back home were really having no real say in any of that. So we then changed and became a, a, a party that was absolutely committed to the European Union. And it's been disappointing to see some MPs who were very sceptical actually changed with yeah. them. And that is where we are now. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, and uh, John McDonald, but both of them uh, over my 30 years in Parliament were in every single lobby that there was, which in any way was uh, opposing EU policies or the whole idea that we couldn't, for example, make it easy to, say, nationalise issues and because of state aid rules and all of that. And I think Jeremy has been probably the last one in the party hierarchy to yeah. shift. I think he's been pushed and pushed and pushed. And he was trying to keep the party together. He had a shadow cabinet that were, ha, ha, were split on it. But most of all, he's been driven by the kind of Keir Starmers and people within the PLP who 
basically will do anything to stop Brexit, not just asking for another referendum or trying to stop a, a WTO deal, but actually wanting to stop it. Mm. And, and we have completely lost faith with those people in the country who haven't changed their minds, except people who sometimes voted to actually go into, the, well, to stay in the common market. Remember, we never got a vote to join mm. in the first place. And now, you know, over the years, recognize that what they voted for wasn't exactly what they thought they were voting for. I think the way you describe it as the 1980s being key to this, and particularly mm. the role that Thatcher played in relation to her attacks on workers' rights and trade union rights and so on. And bit by bit in that period, the left comes to see democracy as, as an insufficient mechanism for changing society. And yet most of the, you know, the rights and good things that have yeah. happened have been brought about by trade union struggle and by, by governments um, and labour governments. So the, the idea that somehow we owe everything to this sort of <laughs> European Union is, it's a myth that has grown up and has been accepted, I'm afraid, by a lot of our younger members and younger activists who just don't know their history and have no idea about the kind of speeches that were made by Barbara Castle and Tony Benn in those days. I was going to actually ask you about if if one of the problems is a lack of historical depth or historical knowledge, because one of the arguments that is frequently pushed, including by people who really should know better, and also by young people who have an excuse not to know better, is precisely this idea that if we leave the EU, that's the end of workers' rights, that's the end of women's rights, that's the end of maternity rights. And the implication that is constantly pushed is that these rights were the gift of, you know, bureaucrats in Brussels who handed them to us because they're such wonderful rulers. The history of the struggle in the UK for democracy and for workers' rights gets completely rewritten through that process. And I think one of the important roles that left-wing voices can play now is to remind people actually of where those rights come from and what the Labour Party used to say about the European community. And that's exactly what the trade unions should be doing. Yeah. I mean, there are very few now of the trade unions. The RMT has been a uh, a, a kind of standout on its own and uh, ASLEF, I think, as well, and a couple of other the smaller unions who, who continually say that and also point out just how restrictive the kind of neoliberal policies of the European Union are in terms of uh, what... For example, it was in Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto in 2017. An awful lot of that would have been made incredibly difficult yeah. by saying in the European Union. And when the history is written of this period, I think the trade unions will not come out of this particularly well, and, and particularly the TUC that I think have played a, a, an incredible role of, of just trying to play down all the big fights that we had and won over the years. And, you know, the problem is, of course, you can say the European Union has helped to pre change things. I don't accept that. But at least if our government or a government is is not, it tries to renege on some of the rights that we've already got written into law, then that's what we have general elections for, mm. you know, and the idea that we're not powerful enough in this country to be able to change government policies. Well, it has happened in the past and people can throw governments out. You can't throw the European Commission out. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast and Spike's other podcasts and also the articles and essays that Spike publishes every day, please think about giving us a donation. Spike's content is free and we want to keep it free and donations really help us to do that. Head over to Spike's donation page now at www.spiked-online.com. I wanted to ask you about your own personal experience of some of these discussions because you get a lot of flack from some supporters of the Labour Party and from some kind of momentum activists and others and and you know from some pretty middle class well connected commentators particularly the ones who live in Vauxhall who think oh. who don't like you they very all much. live in Vauxhall they, <laughs> they all live there and simply as an observer I often find those discussions quite frustrating because I see you and a handful of others as remaining consistent with the left wing and the labor view of the European Union as a neoliberal anti-working class, anti-democratic institution. And yet these people treat you as the traitor to the cause, whereas they are upholding it. They call you a Faragist because you sat on a boat with Nigel Farage as part of the campaigning process. What's your view of those kinds 
of attacks. Do, do you do you take them personally, or do you just see them as part of the kind of broader political clash that's going on right now? I think you get used to being attacked, and no matter how unfair it is, and it usually is unfair. There's no point really in in. I mean, for a long time, I didn't even respond to anything on Twitter that was sort of nasty or whatever. I just ignored it. Occasionally now, I just uh, I'm afraid I have started to block people because I didn't used to at all. I thought you know, <laughs> I'm not going to block anybody, and then I thought, why on earth should I, shouldn't I block some of these absolutely ridiculous、uh, people who make terrible comments?、Mm. But you know, the sad thing is that again, it's it's people who are criticising you. You see, I, I I probably don't fit into a category very neatly because these days you either are seen as being on the left or on the right, and the the policies now. I mean, on on the European Union, I very clearly feel that I take a what would be a completely strong left wing view、mm. of 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 the European Union and all the problems with it. But on a number of other issues, I would be seen as being right wing. I mean, you know, the idea because I decided that actually I didn't think it was particularly.、Um, Sort of libertarian to ban things. I don't really like to ban things unless there's a really, really justified reason. So、mm. the whole issue of hunting was something for me that just seemed like pe- being taken by people who had no understanding of the countryside, no understanding、yeah. of of the kind of miners' hunts that there used to be, the whole way that it was an infrastructure of the countryside brought people together, and all of that. And that suddenly labels you as right wing because you voted, you know, against banning something. <laughs>、um, but. I've always been a great supporter of the trade union movement, and I've been a. I chaired the a number of the trade union groups in Parliament, and I chaired the FBU group until recently when I resigned over their particularly be- bad behaviour over a number of issues, particularly relating to someone Paul Embry who's、yeah. been treated appallingly. So I'm I'm I don't quite fit categories either, and and a lot of this sort of. Maybe just because I'm getting older, a lot of the sort of what would be seen as modern, trendy, liberal ideas about the way people should behave or whatever, I、um, find that I don't necessarily agree with that. And that again labels you. You know, if you're not right on woke,、yeah. I think is that、yeah. the new expression. <laughs> <Yeah> . <laughs>、um, and I find that, but that, and that's what I think is 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 a pity, really, that we've got ourselves into this whole question of. Talking about identity politics and, and and whether people can do things or not do things in a way that is is completely again ignoring that whole strata of our our working class support who don't necessarily go along with any of、yeah. it. I wanted to tease out a couple of precisely those issues with you, but I want to ask you one more question、uh, in relation to the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. Now you've actually, I mean. I think it's fair to say you disagree with Corbyn on some things, but you've actually been always been. Ah,、oh, yes, I was one of the forty-two who stuck with him when there was、yeah. a no confidence, and over a hundred and whatever decided they wanted rid of him. I said very clearly it had only been a year, and that I felt he had the support of the party membership. I've always disagreed with him on some international issues. I think Ireland would be something that I would regret <laughs> diff- differences with him. But you know, I, I he was in a room more or less next to me for. Like thirty years, and I, I, you know, I like Jeremy, and I'm not prepared to just sort of attack Jeremy because of the way other people attack him.、Mm. I'm disappointed now、mm. that he's been pushed the way he has, but he, you know, he's done his best. And、uh, the irony is that the people, an awful lot of the people who are against him, have used the EU issue as a way of getting at Jeremy. I mean, people like Chuka originally took an army. I remember on the night of the election down in Lambeth, it was very clear that. People like him were expecting Labour to have been absolutely triumphed, and he was ready with his,、um, you know, probably his campaign to go for leadership. All of that group who were hoping there might be a change because we would lose badly were let down, and they had they knew they had nowhere to go. They knew they couldn't defeat him because he had support, and I think they saw the European Union and as their sort of cause to get involved with, and looked like they were being,、um, you know, modern and progressive. Do, do you think? Jeremy Corbyn will will come to regret some of the decisions he's made recently because the, one of the most striking things about him over the past three decades, and John McDonnell too, and a, a few others, was their consistently critical and consistently principled approach on issues related to the European Union. And Corbyn, in particular, took a very Benite view、mm-hmm. of the EU as this, you know, as Tony Benn said, you felt like the slave going to Rome when you went to the、he、European Union. He actually went、Union. to Ireland and campaigned or helped to support、yeah. the camp against the Maastricht Treaty and against、right. the,、uh, sorry, the Lisbon, Lisbon. Treaty. The thing that I find most striking about Corbyn, he did a number of good speeches in in after the Lisbon Treaty fiasco in Ireland, when the Irish people, of course, were forced to vote again because they gave supposedly the wrong answer. 
he made the point on a few occasions that, you know, the European Union makes you vote again if it doesn't like what you say. And now he's found himself in a mm-hmm. position, having been pushed around by the Keir Starmers and Emily Thornberrys of the world, of arguing effectively for a second referendum here. So now he he will have all sorts of reasons for having done that, holding a fractured party together and, and wanting to stay on as leader, maybe with the aim of achieving certain things at a certain point. But do you think he will come to regret having shifted quite dramatically from one position to another? I, th- I think he will and he should because he has done nothing to store up Labour support in the country because it's divided at the country at local level now between those who supported you know, what he wants to do, those in Labour constituencies who really don't like the fact we've changed. But more importantly, the, the people who were zealot remainers don't think he's gone far enough. Yeah. So yeah. they have now, they've got the Lib Dems to switch to. And I think he had a real opportunity to, you know, not go along with everything the government said, but to be absolutely clear as he originally was that we were going to leave. We wanted to get a good deal, but we had to get out. And it's this obsession now about, you know, the word catastrophic about if we don't have a, a withdrawal agreement, you know, it's not a deal, it's a treaty. And and that treaty has to be got right because otherwise it's there for a very long time. So yes, I think he will he will regret this. I think there are members of his family who probably are pushing him hard the other way too. Mm-hmm. It's it's upsetting because we have seen a different sort of Jeremy Corbyn on this and it, it wasn't necessary. One of the things you mentioned there and you've mentioned before is the the, the serious risk that Labour is alienating its more traditional voters and, you know, its working class voters. And I think there's a real danger that the contemporary left is doing that in two ways, really. The first is through the left supporting the European Union, whereas huge numbers of working class Labour voters are very sceptical of the European Union, as we know. And also through the adoption of this kind of woke politics and identity politics, which seems to me to great quite explicitly against class politics and Mm. against concerns that people up and down the country have about work and how much they get paid and whether they have good housing and so on. So with the emergence, not necessarily of Jeremy Corbyn himself, who falls more into the traditional left camp or certainly used to, but with the emergence of the kind of momentum movement and the so-called Corbynistas, the kind of youthful, very right on very politically correct left. Do you think we're just going to witness uh, an unprecedented schism between those who claim to be at the leadership of the contemporary left and ordinary working people and what they think the country needs to do? Yes, I do. And I think the, the part of the reason for that now is to, I've heard my colleagues over many years on many issues say things like, well, I know we shouldn't have done that. And that was the wrong policy. I mean, the Iraq war was a classic example of that. And remember when we gave the very small increase to pensions, which was laughable. Mm -hmm. And people said how angry their, their constituents were. And then some of my colleagues would say, but it's, but it's okay. Because when it comes to the general election, they've got nobody else to vote for. They're not going to vote for conservatives. Now that's changed, you know, and we saw that in the European elections. And yes, of course, the Brexit party has, has, has primarily focused in on the EU, but they are picking up people now who think that the Brexit party has people in it who are basically what you would call old fashioned common sense um, politicians. And yeah. that now means that we can't count on, on the, those Labour supporters in, in areas where they feel very strongly that party has ignored them in those leave areas. So I think it's a very serious situation. Of course, it's, it's also happening with the Conservative Party as well. So we're in a, you know, they always say about living in interesting times, but I think really there are very clear chasms that could be right through British politics and whether that is for good or bad, um, you know, remains to be seen. Do you think there is an argument or there could come a time when there would be an argument for a divide in the Labour Party, a kind of natural split? Because one of the, in my view, my, my prejudiced political view, one of the more interesting wings of Labour is, is so-called blue Labour. Mm-hmm. And this section of the party, which 
is the whole, it's a way that we're looking at yeah you know, concentrating on family yeah. and, and work and um sort of basically respect for people and uh, i i think there is a lot of people in the party who are just not being saying very much at the moment yeah but who are more and more willing to think that that is actually where labor should be and not where some of the people who are getting all the publicity are yeah it, do you think there's an argument for that section breaking away or do you think there's a possibility at some point when the kind of fashionable wing of labor which the media gives a lot of attention to and, and numerous platforms to there's a time when they will fade into the background and the so-called blue labor the more traditional view the kind of pro-family pro-community pro-respect pro-nationhood wing will come to the fore I think we will see a lot of the younger people who got involved with momentum and in the Labour Party in that kind of heat of the Jeremy Corbyn star struck. You know, I noticed he didn't go to any big festivals this year. Yeah. So I think <laughs> I think a lot of those younger people, like a lot of young people, you know, will 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 gradually move away as they get involved more with work and families and whatever. I mean, we were I was I suppose at one stage very much on what would been seen mm. as as the hard the hard left, but it also depends, of course, on how the Lib Dems develop, because I think many of the Labour people in Parliament would be actually happier being Lib Dems, some of them, mm. you know, and we've seen some changes. But nobody really wants to be the, the group that leaves. They always feel that, well, if we stay in, then we can, the others will will go or <laughs> we can get. But it, it it is getting to a sort of crunch stage where I'm not sure if there was a general election, um, what on earth we'd be what kind of manifesto we'd be standing on. Yeah, I think one of the things that the the newer left, uh, I don't mean the new left is in the 1960s, but the new left is in the kind of starstruck, youthful mm -hmm. left of the past couple of years. I think one of the things they don't understand possibly is 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 the seriousness of cancelling Brexit. As, as you said at the very mm. start of this, it would be a catastrophe for British democracy. And I think, you know, it seems pretty clear to me that if they were to successfully cancel Brexit, they would instantly void 17.4 million votes. In fact, 32 million votes, because everyone took part in the referendum on good faith that it would happen. And the message that that would send, particularly to those parts of the country where the vote is the only thing people have, they aren't professional protesters. They don't appear on television. They don't have newspaper columns. They don't even tweet really because they're too, they work with their hands. They're too busy to be on mm -hmm. Twitter all day. To those people who literally the only public voice they have is the vote. I, I often think the woke left and other sections of the left doesn't quite understand the seriousness of saying, well, the most important vote you've ever made in your life is null and void mm -hmm. and doesn't matter. And the, the long term consequences that could have for the country. Well, I saw during the referendum campaign when I would go to rallies and people would come up to me at the end and say, oh, thank goodness there's a Labour MP here. You know, we Labour, we've always been Labour, but we're so fed up and we're going to be voting leave. Then I would see the people who would come up to you again and say, we're going to vote. We've never voted before. We're going to be voting in this referendum. And I just feel that there are some people in the establishment who just literally hope that those people will now think, oh, well, Nobody listened to me anyway, so I'll yep. go back to my apathy and not bothering to vote. And I think that is just, it's its almost criminal, just that that attitude. So I feel very, I mean, I was in tears after some of the rallies when you would meet these people who were just so upset about the way Labour was behaving and just desperately wanted their vote to matter. So I think there is an anger out there that is not as you say, um, you know, it's not demonstrating at the moment. It's not doing all these uh, things that, that people in London do. It's a very much a metropolitan sort of issue of, of, of demonstrating. And I, but I think the anger is there and it wouldn't take an awful lot to get that anger to be starting to do things that, you know, would be showing that they're not going to put up with that. <laughs> You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. Subscribe now so that you never miss an episode. And it would be great if you could give us a rating and maybe even a review. That is a really good way to help new listeners discover the show. I want to ask you about the uh, catastrophizing that we're currently living through in relation to No Deal. 
um, because the language, I mean, th- there's always been fear mongering around No Deal, this idea that it would be cliff edge, cliff edge, <laughs> car crash, all this stuff. But it seems to be reaching a crescendo of craziness. And it increasingly sh- seems to me that the, the hysterical depiction of No Deal or WTO deal as the, um, the worst thing that could ever happen to this country is really part of the broader attempt to stop Brexit entirely because it's about problematizing the whole idea of ever trying to exist outside of the European Union. How do you count? I mean, you must hear it quite a lot. You must see it on your Twitter feed or when you Mm. encounter people. How do you confront this notion that if we were to walk away or crash out, that it would be a complete and utter disaster for the country? Well, I always like to say something very simple, which is basically the rest of the world is not in the European <laughs> Union. You know, the idea that somehow 27 countries, if we were to leave, is is, is the kind of way that we should all be focusing our our, uh, our future economic prospects is just such nonsense. But you're right that I think the no deal has become basically no Brexit. You know, that is really what it's about. Unfortunately, we've had a media again, particularly the mainstream media over the past year and a year and a half, just used uh, No Deal uh, in a, in a way that is almost taken for granted. That every single journalist and everyone on television, if you're not in favour of stopping No Deal, then somehow you must be, you know, absolutely raving mad. I mean, it really is got to that stage, and I think we there's never been a a, a way. There's never been any real attempt made to explain and allow people to explain how a WTO could work, would work, and how after we leave, if the preparation's been there for a a WTO, we can actually get all sorts of other arrangements even before we leave as well, that all these little mini deals. But every time I remember being on Newsnight a couple of times where you started to sort of almost try and explain. And, and, and I remember, I think it was um, Peter Lilly trying to do it as well. And they stop you. They actually don't want <laughs> people to hear mm-hmm. the other uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, the argument. So it's become now, I think we just have to keep being clear to the public that anyone who's saying that no deal is a disaster are basically saying they want to stay in the European Union. One of the most cynical aspects of this politics of fear, which is what it is, is the use of the border in Ireland. And so the argument that is constantly used now, I think in a a profoundly cynical way, is this notion that if there is any amendment to the border or any even mild increase in infrastructure, for example, Ireland will descend into chaos, the, the men of violence will come back, it will be pandemonium, the Republic of Ireland won't be able to survive. That, I think, is a very sinister aspect of this because it's using the concerns of another nation, the Republic of Ireland, against the democratic wishes of this nation, the UK. How do you, obviously you're from Northern Ireland, you have very, very close attachments with it. How do you confront this notion that if we effectively, if we leave the European Union at all, then Anglo-Irish relations will just fall apart. Well, it, 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 it's just such nonsense again, because obviously the common travel area was there long before we joined the common market. There's going to be no change to that. Irish people are going to be very welcome in Great Britain. They're going to be able to vote. Many of them voted in the referendum. Actually, quite a few I met voted leave. Mm. So it's not it's not just at all. But what to me is so sinister about it is somehow the idea that that our whole future and policies of a referendum that decided we wanted to leave are supposed to be now being influenced by a relatively small number of dissidents, not even traditional um, uh, Republican uh, Sinn Féin IRA, but actual dissidents, and that we would change our whole policies because of that. It is just such nonsense. And then it has been deeply, deeply sad to me uh, because we had good relations with the Republic of Ireland and we bailed them out. You know, we've we've had a a, a very strong uh, bond there, which um, we saw when the Queen visited how many people came out to see her and all of that. And everything was, and somehow the Irish government has just, perhaps because they are members of the club, which is the European Union, and seemed to hatch up with the European Union, this idea that the border was going to be the thing that could yeah. make the United Kingdom have to stay in a customs union and single market. And it it is it is so crass, really, but it's also devious and um, underhand and has caused fear in border areas where there was absolutely no reason for that to happen. I mean, I was down in Fermanagh over the summer 
met lots of farmers and so on, many of them not as fearful as what you see when the media go there. They always tend to interview the um, the people who are who are against Brexit. Mm. They very rarely pick up people who are. And, you know, it's quite clear that the back and forward trade that goes on can easily be dealt with by the trusted trader scheme. There's no reason why any of that can't happen. And an awful lot of the rest of it can be covered by the technological re- means that are already used because we have a different uh, corporation tax, excise mm. duties, um, currency. I mean, we've already got a border. I think mm. the difference between a border and a frontier has not been you know, put out in a way that people have understood and people have not wanted to understand it, certainly at government level. I think you're absolutely right when you say that the argument that is implicitly being made in all of this is that we can't possibly take this action because of how these small violent groups might respond. And I think actually, not only is that a ridiculous approach, but it's potentially a dangerous one because increasingly it strikes me that Remainers who whip up fear about the border in Ireland um, are in some ways writing the script or yeah. they risk writing the script. They're giving succour to dissidents and right. giving them almost a sort of, come on, it's okay now because we're 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 going to have leaving the EU. So that gives you a, a reason, an excuse to do things yeah. um, in a violent way. Yeah. I think it's it's lethal. You mentioned there, as you were talking, and this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you, about the mainstream media. And some of the comments you've made over the past year or so about the BBC always make me laugh. And um, I completely agree with them. The BBC is, you know, Remainer overload. There's this bizarre idea among some Remainers, Lord Adonis is one, but there are others too, who think that the BBC is the Brexit Broadcasting Corporation, which I think is... It might suggest they kind of have lost the plot to some extent, but it, it strikes most other people and most ordinary people that the mainstream media and the BBC being key to all of this is not giving a fair hearing to the Brexit side of the argument, to the pro WTO side of the argument, to any reasoned rational case for leaving the European Union and leaving it cleanly and fully. And so why do you think that is? And do you think there's a real danger that the BBC is going to trash its reputation as during this process? I think the BBC in particular has been very almost afraid to allow voices that are going against what is the established view on the European Union and, and particularly a, a, a no deal. But you have to remember that most of the journalists who work in the BBC would have been supportive of the European Union, would have voted Remain. Again, we're shocked that people voted against. And I just think they have got to a stage now where there's an awful lot of people out there who again feel that the BBC, to be a state you know, broadcaster paid for by public funds, is behaving irresponsibly. And I don't have an answer to it because, you know, you can criticize. We, we've, uh, there's been a huge amount of research done into just the way, particularly the Today program has handled the numbers of people mm. from the Leave side and the Remain side. During the referendum, they had to be a little bit more careful. But once that referendum was over, it's been very much putting a Remain point of view, you know, bringing in people, the ex prime ministers, you know, I mean, Michael Heseltine hasn't been involved in politics for a very long time, yet he's rolled in every practice every week. So, I'm beginning now, having been a great supporter of the BBC, particularly the World Service and uh, some of the, the work that they do, then I, I begin to think, well, actually, why are we paying a license mm. fee? Why are we paying it at such a, a level when not only are they taking it away from over 75s, which I'm not quite there yet, but they are also not reflecting across the country the views of people the 17.4 million people. Mm. So we may have, I think we'll find more and more people questioning whether they need to have that huge subsidy. Yeah. My final question is on your maverick nature. Um, Mm. Because I think one of the things that you are best known for is taking positions that you think are right. So even if it gets you in trouble, you got into trouble with John Smith, Labour leader in the early 90s in relation to the Maastricht Treaty. Um, you got into well, trouble. Well, that was just stupid. We were all, we were all we posed it for months and months and months, spent late, late nights. And then on the final vote, they said, we're going to abstain. <laughs> that was just such a tip. You obviously, lots of people think you're right wing because you oppose the ban on fox hunting, as, as I do too. And you oppose other, oppose other sorts of bans. 
you're favourable towards the monarchy, which kind of rubs some yeah, Labour leftists up I, I the am, wrong I mean, way. That might, must make me, but why should that make you right wing? Yeah, but, the, you know? it, 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 but there yes, are lots of people who yeah, are. I understand. I guess, and I want to tie I mean, I this in. I just want a President Blair. That's my worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> royal family. That's a good concern. But I want to tie this into the, the other point, which is that you are not going to stand for election again in Vauxhall. So you are going to be leaving at least Parliament. So um, d- what will you do in the future? How will you make good use of your maverick approach to politics? And will you carry on pushing the case for leaving the European Union, presuming we haven't left at that point? Yes, well, I'm very, I I really didn't want to leave Parliament until we had left Mm. the European Union. That would have been my final feeling that I had managed to get something that I'd always fought for through and final. I said I wouldn't stand in 2015. I said I wouldn't stand again in Vauxhall. Um, And then 2017, I had to, it was all happened very quickly. And I said then I wouldn't stand. And I've made it very clear, I'm not standing as the Labour candidate in Vauxhall. Um, Who knows what will happen in the next few months. Right. Okay. Watch this space. But I will still be involved in politics one way or the other. Kate Hoey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.